OSHA, CDC, Department of Labor, and a slew of health entities primarily study traditional employed workers. Though we can learn from the information they provide, around 72% of beauty service providers are self-employed, and we aren't fully aware of workplace hazards or what to do about them. Our careers often end abruptly because we have years of overexposure to toxins, hidden in physical stresses with little protection. We're on our own, and at the very least should be aware of standards and practices that will increase our health and career options. Today, we'll talk with industry veteran Dr. Carolyn Kraske, chiropractors and soft tissue experts Dr. Una Ford and Theodore Rick, discuss ways to balance total mind and body function as presented by neurodevelopment specialist Janet Oliver, and sprinkle in inspirational tips to jumpstart improved safety culture and practices. This is part of an ongoing effort to improve safety culture for you and all other beauty industry service providers. I'm your host, Mary Reed. I'm a licensed instructor, service provider, card-carrying OSHA member, member of the American Industrial Hygiene Association, National Safety Council, and more. You can call me the safety lady. Dr. Carolyn Kraske has been licensed and was first licensed in Minnesota in 1959. She's owned two schools and two salons here in Minnesota, both of them, correct? Yes. So even though she has recently retired, Carolyn continues her unwavering commitment to advocating and helping licensees understand best practices. She supports them in their careers. She helps them understand uh, how to have longevity in the career and helps them with license maintenance. And I just thank you for being here, Carolyn. Well, thank you for inviting me. Yes, whenever I mention your name to someone, Carolyn Kraske, who's in the industry, they say, yes, I know her, she helped me, she showed me, you know, she, you know, everything. She knows X, Y, Z. And so I couldn't think of a better person to have this discussion with as far as um, helping service providers. And so I, again, I just thank you for being here. Gush, gush, gush. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Let's talk first about some of the hidden stresses. We know that there are you know, all kinds of hazards and we'll talk about those through the program, but there are some hidden stresses that we as service providers experience. And one of them are um, just maintaining your license. What are some of the problems that people come to you with in maintaining their license? Well, because they've changed the laws so many times that sometimes it's hard for those in the industry to keep up with it. And they're not aware that these things have changed and then made it harder for people to keep a license because now they impose that you have to have so many hours of continuing education every three years to renew the license. And sometimes it's difficult to find those providers. Yeah, well, that is true. Um, there are so many things, not just in Minnesota, but um, license deregulation all across the land. There are RICO laws that uh, basically racketeering level um, where you're paying thousands and thousands of dollars. On average, it's about $20,000 to become a licensed um, cosmetologist in Minnesota. So you go through, you get your, your $20,000 worth of education, but before you can take a test so that you can actually work in the field, they give you a test <laughs> so that they make sure that the school taught you whatever you were supposed to learn. And you have a finite amount of time, so one year to um, complete that test and all the while there's money. You know, there's money, 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 money going out and nothing coming in. So it's, it's, it's very difficult um, with given that and then the fact that they are always changing, um, you know, the requirements. And I won't say for no reason, but almost for no reason. Um, uh, recently the uh, eyelash extension people Mm -hmm. They were uh, pulled out of, uh, what is it? Um, Cosmetology and estiology. Estiology. Right. So they were at some point working with the, the dermatologists and that type of thing. The dermatologists were appreciating them. They were paying for their education and, and basically they were making more money. 
So cosmetology, for whatever, you know, whatever their, their reason was, they decided that that was not a viable thing for them to do. And if you worked in a dermatology office, then you would lose your credits or you wouldn't be given uh, credit. So, you know, dermatologists weren't necessarily willing to become um, licensed salons so that they could make the cosmetology department happy. Right. Um, and so anyway, that is still kind of uh, uh, just a mess. And we're seeing that all across the land. And it's leading to um, more private certifications so that people can actually work and it's a more balanced thing. Uh, I don't know if that's helping the stress because right now it's just kind of messy. But I don't know, what do you? what is your take on it? Well, and they, because they've changed laws so much and initially they didn't make it so hard for people, especially coming from foreign countries, to get a license. And then they changed those laws and said, oh, you all have to have a high school diploma or a GED. Well, some of those people couldn't prove that from the countries they came from. Absolutely. So it made it real difficult. Now they're looking at it and saying, well, maybe we should change that back. Well, if you'd have left it alone to begin with, <laughs> exactly. it wouldn't have been a problem. Exactly. And it would be different it was, if it were helping people, you know, in some way. But I see the numbers dropping very dramatically since about 2015, I started paying attention. And for example, I have four licenses. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I have two now because the other ones don't matter, but an instructor license and a manager license. And there's a sonar, which is something meaning that some laws that are pending to be changed, that basically the manager license, which we used to have to work 2,700 hours for initially, mm -hmm. before we could even apply for this particular license, it's basically going to be null and void, except in very, very rare circumstances. So that's a lot of time, that's a lot of money. Um, money is, is bad enough, but you cannot get time back. So this no. is why people are leaving the profession. Well, and sometimes too, it's because they just feel they work so hard and they can't get anywhere ahead. Right. They're not making enough money. Right, and, and that is um, the average stylist makes about $24,000 uh, and some change. And we'll talk about those numbers because those are Department of Labor numbers. And one of the things, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll mention it now. One of the things with Department of Labor, OSHA, and some of our large entities, they are not um, monitoring or studying or collecting information on the average stylist. The average stylist, and there's about 72% of us um, that we consider average stylists and service providers. That's braiders, weavers, lacticians, barbers, anybody in the beauty and hair industry. They lump together, so that's why I'm lumping them together. 72% um, of us are self-employed, and those entities do not represent the self-employed. And so that's why we have an issue with um, maintaining license, having a say in certain things, mm -hmm. as well as our safety. And that's why we're here today to talk about that. Well, and Department of Labor also recognizes apprenticeship programs, but our board does not recognize apprenticeship programs. Right. And that's, what do they say, that's crazier than a soup sandwich. Um, not helpful. Um, again, not bringing people into the industry. And I have nothing against, for example, the salon suites that are cropping up, that's you know a market mm -hmm. and you know more power to them. I work in one. Right. But they are very, very much in tune with the board and they're looking at the big numbers. They say that, that across the state, they say that there's 3,400 licensees. So each of them thinks that they're going to have 70% of the licensees in their chain or their, their salon suites. And it's a very, very small pool that's shrinking more and more. And these salon suites are doing some very interesting things with the board to make laws so they could have people sooner. Mm -hmm. So one of the things is they are having people right out of school rent a space at a salon suite. Yes. Now, sounds great. You, you know, you're you know, a <laughs> rock star when you graduate and this type of thing. You have two clients that follow you. But the tricky part is you are signing contracts, commercial building contracts. Right. And it doesn't matter if you are there one day or two days or, you know, whatever's going on. 
if you don't have enough people to maintain that 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 rent, that's right. Then you're out of the salon suite number one, but you're still on the hook as far as the contract. Commercial contracts work that way, um, and so I think the average young person coming out of school doesn't know that, no, and so don't. the the cosmetology board wins because they have this licensee and they've placated or they've made the salon suite owners quite happy. And the <laughs> salon owners, they're gonna get paid regardless on if you're there or if you're not. And I gotta say, most of them are not really helping you build clientele either. No, they don't. And you, again, in addition to some loans that you may have taken out for your education mm -hmm. and not being able to work initially um, now you have a big, bigger bill, which is the salon suites. And, and I, I haven't looked at the averages lately, but they were around 250 or 275 a week, 275 per week. And the average um, person coming out of school cannot support in, that. No. Right? Yeah. So, you know, we're here to warn you about that. That's another type of stress, one of those hidden stresses. That's Financial right. Financial burdens are very real in this industry. That's very true. And it doesn't matter if it's a school or if it's a salon. Right. There are hidden things that you do not know. So it's best to read your contract or read your lease. And how much money are you having to put out before you take something in? Absolutely. Um, just don't fall for the pretty shiny things. You, no. have, to, you have to do the math. You really <laughs> that's do. right. Uh, sleep deprivation. That's something that's real, real common in our general population. Uh, CDC says 43% of us are not getting enough sleep. Why it matters if you're a, a service provider is you get a little sloppy. And when you get a little sloppy and you're working with shears and you're working with needles and these types of things, um, it's extremely dangerous for you. That's right. So um, make sure you get your sleep. I mean, what's what? think about what's common. Uh, a 40-hour work week? Well, that isn't common. <laughs> in our profession, that's not common. And students coming to school, too, are working, a lot of them, a part-time job, plus coming to school for an eight-hour day, which is like a job, and they're not getting enough sleep. I've had students fall asleep in my classroom because yeah. they just did not get enough sleep. Yes. So any idea, anything besides go get some sleep um, that you could recommend to them? Well, in eating properly, yeah. I use the analogy of um, what did you eat for breakfast today? And they say Coke and a bag of potato chips. Well, what nutritional value is in that? You got sugar and salt is right. all you got. Right. Uh, how about eating a sandwich or eating an egg or eating something that's nutrition, has some nutrition and some fruit? Right. I, I mean, um the, the industry, you can't let it run you. If you want to no. have longevity in the industry, you are going to have to plan. You're going to have to set aside time, uh, money, uh, you know, set some priorities. And you can literally write these types of things down uh, so you can help yourself again. It's about career longevity and staying healthy in that process. Well, and having breaks too. The first job I had, I had a boss, he didn't care if I ever ate or took a break. <laughs> so it was like, I need to use the restroom and I need to have a break. And then the coworker that was with me, she went and told him, she said, we need a lunch break and we need, you know, a bathroom break. And I said, you're going to get me fired. She said, no, I'm not. <laughs> she well, didn't. And there are, there are protocols in place, again, for the employed people. So right. you were lucky. Um, when you're trying to make a rent that you know you really can't afford, you're going to be just grinding and grinding and grinding until you are out of energy. That's and right. you are out of a career because you just didn't take care of yourself. You must take care of yourself. And the last thing, we're going to talk a little bit, um, we're going to do a demonstration about some of the dangers in the salon, uh, some of the common chemicals and, and whatnot that we need to be aware of. But one of the, the interesting numbers I came up with recently was about HIV. And generically, we as, as stylists, it's, we're not studied uh, nope. per se, 
but there are things that are <laughs> trendy, and we'll talk about those a little bit later, that just are unhealthy. And, you know, we have to look at, do we want to be responsible? Are we going to blame, you know, someone else if we get HIV? Are we doing anything to pre prevent these types of things? Because in our industry, they don't even think about vaccines. Um, they, you know, it, it, not that we need another burden, but this is one to protect yourself. So if you don't get uh, uh, high, what did I want to say, high back, but um, if you're HIV. not getting your um, vaccines, um, Tdap, those types of things. Uh, every you know, every ten years, what do you get the booster? Um, oh, for um, I can't think of it either now. Um, we'll get that back your, later in the in the show. Your DBT shots. Yes. So um, make sure you're getting those vaccines, even though it's not required by the industry. It's just a way to protect yourself. If you get a hepatitis B, a B shot, then Hep B will probably um, stave off hep C, D, you know, they just progress up to HIV. And right now, one in seven people have HIV and they don't know it. If you deal with shears, if you deal with needles, any of those types of things, in our industry, they're not looked at uh, as seriously. And the protocols and procedures that are in place with for nurses and for doctors and for tattoo artists and anyone else who deals with these um, potential bloodborne pathogen uh, carriers. Some years ago, I don't remember what year it was, probably in the early um, 80s or before that maybe, they did a panel study when Mike Hatch was... Um, governor? No, he wasn't the governor. He, um, no, but they had a panel of uh, people in the health industry studying this and they said, who do you think in your profession between the cosmetologists, estheticians, and manicurists are the most prevalent that would be um, exposed to HIV because this is when they oh. first discovered it. Okay. And we said the nail techs or the estheticians because they cut and they okay. peel and they do these things on the skin, which a cosmetologist is probably the least likely because yes, they can be exposed because they cut hair and it's not like a person coming into a salon or a school even, you say, do you have HIV? No. No, nobody ever asks, and you can't refuse them anyway because they're there for a service, but you would probably be a little more careful. We don't know who sits in our chair, no. only what they tell us, and even say they're one of the ones that don't know. Yeah. Um, and how many times, I, my, I have marks because Mm -hmm. Every time I get a new pair of shears, just adjusting to it, I'm going to cut, cut myself. Yep. So there are things that I had do now mm -hmm. to take care of that wound um, that I didn't do before. I just like, you know, well, maybe just, if I had a Band-Aid, yeah. wrap it up. But there's other things I do now. Well, hair infections too. Hair infections. You don't wash your hands, you can get infections. Yep. From cutting yourself and getting hair in there or under your nails. Yep, and our, mu our eyes, mucous yes. membranes, any of that, that we're, we just need to be aware. And it's not mm -hmm. that this information isn't out there, but it's for other fields. So we're bringing it to you so that you can practice more safely. Let's take a look uh, at some of the dangers in the salon, Carol, and okay. then we'll, we'll come back. Another thing we want to consider is how many dangerous products that we deal with every day. 
when a regular person comes in, they have a service, they experience something, and then they leave. With a stylist, we are there as many hours in a week as we're working, whether it's 40 or 60 or whatever outrageous number um, of hours. So Carolyn, I got to say thank you again for being here. And we're going to look at just a few of the most dangerous products in the salon. Okay. Uh, one of them, we know, deals with peroxides and colors and what other things go with colors that you could think about that are really dangerous. That go with color? Yeah, like bleaching and those well, lighteners. Well, yes, bleaching and um, many stylists put those uh, their customers under a dryer. That makes it more dangerous because yes. you can cause scalp burns. Yep, so the client is, is in peril, but we are also experiencing fumes. And one of the things that has a lot of fumes that we'll talk about are keratin complexes. Uh, very popular service. I don't know why, um, but very, very dangerous for the service provider. Uh, what are some other names that care, uh, that formalin, excuse me, that keratin goes under, Carolyn? Um, Brazilian hair straighteners is yep, one hair name. Hair straighteners. Hair straighteners, yes. And it's used on all types of hair. Mm -hmm. And the fumes are very, very dangerous. Also to the stylist, um, skin rashes. Um, I knew one stylist that had to, just the exposure of this product in the salon caused him major uh, health problems. Yep. Probably respiratory, but could have been other Skin. things. Skin burns. Hands, just peeled. Yep. So you have to be aware of the level of exposure that you're getting. So if we, if we could, Carolyn, imagine that this is a 55 gallon tub. And a 55 gallon tub was just too heavy to bring in here today. But uh, a safe exposure, according to the OSHA, excuse me, how many, how many, how, how much of that do you think you'll use for a safe exposure? So imagine this is parts per million. One drop, two drops, three drops, four drops. Maybe four. Maybe four. You're exactly on point. That is considered the maximum ex exposure that you should have to this chemical as far as the fumes that it emits in an eight hour period. Now, that is definitely not what's happening in the salons. Um, if you work in those salon suites and you have about 25 workers and there are even three of those people who are doing these types of services back to back, there's a lot of money in it but you have to weigh the risk of, of what you're exposing your body to. Um, that is overexposure, and like Carolyn mentioned, there are certain things that you should look for. Rashes. Uh, breathing. Breathing problems. Itching. Um, skin discoloration. Any of those things, if you're experiencing those, it's not a good thing. And you really, that means that you've been overexposed to at least this chemical. So be wary of that. Um, something as simple as shampoos, those are all not created equal. Uh, so any, any stories about shampoos that were nightmares for people that they? Some people that are allergic to some of the products that they put in shampoos, glis uh, glycerin. Glycerin. Sulfates. Yep. Those are a couple of the chemicals that I've experienced customers and students in the school. Yep. That were allergic to those things. Absolutely. So this, I'm not promoting any particular brand, but you want to look for things that are perhaps sulfate free, paraben free, have fewer uh, of the different chemicals. If there's a list of 18 chemicals and you can't pronounce most of them, uh, you might want to really reconsider what type of shampoos and conditioners you're using. Relaxers, again, I'm not promoting or, or saying anything negative about any particular company, but these are very common in our salons and these risk all kinds of things. So relaxers, they have sodium hydroxide, lithium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, but trust me, if it says hydroxide, it's some type of relaxer. And generically, those can eat away, just all the way through the skin, the hair, um, the scalp, and you experience things like what? 
Well, hair loss. Hair loss. That's one of the things. Um, uh, scalp burns. Very, very common. common. And peop it's so common that people have gotten used to it as far as uh, uh, patrons. But what is it doing to you? What are you, what are you, um, are you wearing your gloves yes. for protection? Some people are so used to it that they, you know, they'll, they'll accept the burns. They'll accept these types of um, just negative things. And it's just really not a good plan. But nobody's going to stop doing relaxers uh, if there's money in it. Nobody's stopping doing keratins because there's money in it. So again, you, you have to really start looking at yourself and career longevity because at some point, um, things could happen and your career just ends abruptly. Uh, one of the things that we noticed, or well, that we know, is that if you mix certain chemicals, so we're always, you know, creating different things in the <laughs> salon, good idea or not, we, I know it's done. Um, so if you take relaxer, which is a, cur a straightening product, and you take thioglycolate, which is a curling, curling product, product. Um, what do you get? What happens in the salon if you mix those two? Well, nothing good. Nothing good. It's not going to work on your hair. I can tell you that. Yep. You're going to have your hair is going to fall out. Fall those out. two, those two things fight. So if you have those two chemicals, just because you were just being creative, and it it um, lasts well enough so that get somebody home, they're probably going to have hair loss. And that again is not a good thing in the salon, but somebody else thought it was a great thing. And so that is what they have. The two main ingredients in there are sodium hydroxide and thioglycolate. So those two things that fight in the salon and aren't good for you, they are sold and you know approved by the FDA for the, another purpose. So uh, if you don't want hair loss, uh, don't mix certain chemicals. And you just really have to be aware. Go ahead, Carol. Well, and also using heat on things that some of these chemicals that should never be used with heat. Bleaches. Um, these things are used with heat. That's why another reason they are dangerous. Right, because they per, um, perpetuate the fumes. You said heat, and along those lines, my goodness, um, there's different types of blow dryers, of course, and how you even use your tools right? Some people like blow torches practically. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. when they're straightening the hair, especially with a keratin, they're straightening it. They've had too much product on the hair in the first place, and then it starts to smoke. That's not only affecting them and their respiratory issues it, and their patron. If you're in a, in a salon suite, for example, uh, most of them have open ceilings, meaning that is not trapped in your little room with just you. It's going all around the building. And how many people are usually in a salon suite? Well, I, I'm not sure. It depends on how big they are. That's Could true. Could be 10, 12, yep. bigger. They, yep. I've seen them up to about 25. So it does depend on the, on the company and whatnot. We'll talk a little bit later about ergodynamics and how you can hold your tools so that they're um, safe for you. Um, we talked about some of the dangers. Now let's talk about some of the things that you can do to protect yourself, aside from not using certain things and not mixing things that you're not sure of. Um, extensions, not a bad thing. A real common one is sewn in extensions, but they have tapes and they have all kinds of things. But I think the most dangerous one uh, is the sew-in. Um, if you saw this particular thing, which is just a needle, if you saw this in a doctor's office, would you be uh, alarmed? Well, if it had been used, I would. But mm -hmm. you wouldn't know that unless they told you. Right. Normally, they take them out of a, a sterile paper. Exactly. We don't. Nope. It's not uncommon to have extension hair, some needles, some thread, and all other things that you might uh, need to use in a drawer. And so this thing is a weapon if it's not um, taken care of properly. So 
One of the things that you want to look for, instead of getting a pointy tip needle, and that's what they typically sell, you can ask or look for blunt tip needles because those are less likely to puncture the skin. And why this matters, if you, if you are a tattoo artist, if you're a doctor, if you're a nurse, if you're uh, almost anything else, a drug addict, they know that needles and needle pokes are dangerous. So you as a stylist must be aware and use some precautions. At the very, very least, um, store your needles separately, clean them separately. If you're off-site or anything, they do have these types of things. Do you know what this is? Yeah, it's for sharps. Yep. So Anything a, sharp you yep. put in there. Exactly. So these are um, things that once you've performed a service, until you sterilize your needles or that type of thing, if you're going to reuse them, um, Use a sharps container, especially if you're traveling about. Don't just leave a needle in a drawer because HIV is real, and we've talked about that a little bit. Last thing for now, uh, nail polish remover. Seems harmless enough, very, very dangerous. You see it in the nail salons, and mm -hmm. I'm sure at your school you had nail techs. Oh yes, yep. lots of them. So there are mask, masks that some of them choose to wear but it's nine out of 10 times something that you'd use in a cafeteria. It doesn't do anything really helpful. So this you might see at a construction site or? Yes, uh, any, anyone that would be doing construction, uh, ripping plaster off a wall, taking down sheetrock, yep. uh, demolishing a building, yep. anything like that. Yep, so these actually collect particles and they're designed to do something very specific. They take particles out of the air. There are different um, levels of mass that take different particles and residues out of the air. And I know they're not the cutest thing, but um, it's for your life. So consider at least when you're doing these types of services or anything that has a lot of fumes involved, consider wearing a mask and a mask that actually takes particles out of the air. Also the dust, it's for dust too. Absolutely. When you're filing nails, it's dust. Absolutely. So you're creating a hazardous condition. Yes, so I, it's, it, it, these are, this is just the tip of the iceberg, but you can practice safely. Um, just be aware and don't mix your chemicals. That's, that's another thing. Absolutely, don't mix chemicals. Don't mix chemicals, all right. Well, um, definitely, especially in this industry of, you know, hairstyling, musculoskeletal complaints are going to be a common occurrence because of what you guys do every day. And so one of the things that you can look out for would, of course, be common symptoms like neck pain, pain down the arm, especially if you're, you know, holding your arm up in that position of, you know, cutting hair or styling, you know, if you're using both arms for braiding or whatever it is that you do, you know, that this position all day long tends to compress the nerves that are in the you know, neck and shoulder area, especially where they connect. And so common symptoms would be shoulder pain, neck pain, radiating pain down your arm, numbness or tingling, some of those things that sometimes people call carpal tunnel, but there are many other you know, variations on that, that before you get to the point of it being the severe you know, carpal tunnel, and a lot of those carpal tunnel symptoms that people may have in their wrists can start from their neck. All right, from a holistic uh, perspective, are there any things that you could recommend to help like relieve the toxins in our body? Well, definitely. All the things that we were talking about in terms of how chiropractic can help with the nervous system also can apply to helping the body detoxify some of the many chemicals that therapists and stylists are exposed to in their environment. So by maintaining that healthy nervous system, it improves the function of the organs like your liver and your kidneys and your lungs that have to purify and get rid of those uh, chemicals that are breathed in. If you're you know, spraying hairspray or some of the things that um, you know, you're using in your, in your business, so by maintaining the proper nervous system function, that helps you know, from that perspective. But in addition to that, making sure that you're eating 
a healthy diet with lots of vegetables, fruits, you know, juices, smoothies, those kind of things give your body a lot of antioxidants that then additionally help the body to remove those toxic chemicals from the body. But you have to have a good functioning nervous system, good functioning organs, good food, good water, lots of rest, sleep, all those things Tell help. Tell us more about soft tissue, Theodore. Yeah, so soft tissue is the soft tissue inside the body. There's nice smooth movement, all right? Soft, smooth, that's typically that, that smooth movement. Now, as a stylist, a lot of times they have different hand gestures, all right? One's higher, one's lower. This one's not moving as much here. So what can happen is adhesions can take place in the soft tissue, and those adhesions can create pain in the body. Are there any other signs or symptoms that people should be aware of that perhaps they need some help? Uh, yes, especially I would say pay attention to your feet and what you're wearing. Um, so for instance, you know, a lot of stylists stand all day long and so foot pain would be a very common symptom that people might have. The thing that they don't necessarily realize is that sometimes that foot pain can lead then to lower back pain. So if you're noticing that your arches are starting to drop and your shoe size is increasing, then, you know, that might be then associated with some lower back issues that may develop as that goes, as that becomes worse, or knee pain, because I've got patients right now that have had foot pain that then turns into knee pain, that then turns into lower back pain and sciatica. Well, thank you for being here, Janet. I know that uh, you began exploring neurodevelopment and tying body and mind things together way before it was a fashionable and cool thing to do. Uh, but it's certainly an important thing and you're considered a pioneer in the field. And so can you tell me a little bit about your expertise and what led you um, to, to understanding how important the head and the, or not the head, but the, the mind and the body are in, in as far as maintaining your overall health. Okay, well thanks for having me first. And uh, I've been a neurodevelopmental specialist for about 20 years and I just got my PhD, so I've oh made it. And one <laughs> of the reasons I wanted to get it is because it is one of those crossover fields. It's not uh, a really, uh, most fields are very specific and very, uh, and, and we're not, we're, we're, we're more general, we connect things. We make connections between things in the body, the brain, and the neurosystem and development, how people change over time. And so it goes into psychology, physiology, neurology. It has a lot of different things. And I've worked in my practice, planned for learning and living for 20 years. So I've been really had a lot of experience clinically. And now I'm writing books and doing more training and things because this is a really exciting field to help people to work with their bodies and their brains more efficiently. Because Absolutely. yeah, it, all through life we need to have, we, some people have more trauma, more challenges, more stress, and they have a hard time getting the, the efficiency out of their brain and body that they'd like with attention, mood, uh, learning, a, and just movement. One of the things that Una and Theodore had talked about is you think that you're experiencing this because of A, but really it's tight, it's you know misdiagnosed basically. And so I think what your neural development area does is help with a proper diagnosis. Yeah, diagnosis is a funny word because really so many of the things I work with are shadow syndromes or they overlap and they go, um, you know, many things all feed into one thing. So you think, oh, do I have ADHD or do I have uh, another kind of condition? But those aren't really diseases. People in the past have thought of them Just as conditions. Yeah, they're conditions. They're neurodevelopmental differences. So they're different how our actual neurology, brain, and body are working. And so they're really just a list of symptoms. But we see symptoms like attention is a good example. We see that as like having a, a, a temperature uh, when you're sick. It's, it's not really a thing in itself. It's a result of something. Exactly. So oh, in, in, in the salon, 
Okay. Mm -hmm. We have all of these outside, you know, influences that are affecting us in a negative way sometimes. And then we go into the salon and we actually work and there's even more exposure to hazards and, you know, just really more concentrated um, attacks on our, on our person. So what does, what can we do? I mean, I mean, you're just bombarded at all times with, you know, these different levels of I don't know, what would you say, hazards? Well, hazards and toxins, I mean, to be honest, uh, so many of the products used in uh, cosmetology in all, uh, all the field, in many ways, the, the makeup, the, the nails, the hair, you know, and their, their products are important, but they also have a lot of toxins in them because they're solvents and they have other things to make color and et cetera. So handling them correctly and taking care of uh, your exposure level is really, really important uh, for all people because it can really affect not only you, but if you're a young person, your children <laughs> and even that. So we, we want to be really thoughtful and follow directions on these products. I know sometimes it's a hassle. People don't want to do it. They don't want to take the time. But I'm telling you that if you're exposing yourself over and over for long periods of times, those chemical interactions are toxic to your neurosystem. They are actually neurotoxins. And so they affect your neurotransmitters. So you mm -hmm. are and some of them are hormone disruptors. That's correct, that's so. right. Hormone disruptors and even uh, neuro disruptors so that they, you actually can affect your attention, your focus, your energy, your mood, uh, and even learning to some degree. So we really want to be thoughtful about that. And you know, if uh, especially for your, for young women, but young men too, to some degree, uh, you when you are young, you may not be pregnant when you're doing these things, but your eggs are in you, and that in itself can affect be affected any future uh, you know children, children. or yeah, and then in utero and birth. along along those lines. One of the things I noticed, and again, no studies found that I've ever run across and I, I dig a little but um, most hair braiders who are of childbearing age most of them that I've run across actually if they do get pregnant they might not lose their children but they are you know uh, put in bed rest um, uh, they have difficult pregnancies maybe they have a few miscarriages until they and then they finally conceive you know these types of things and I figured out, just looking at other industries, that it's when they burn the plastic, like if they're oh. doing a, a synthetic extension, there's these fumes that come up, and those have been traced to different things. So the, the, the plastics that they burn, there's ways that you can close off at the end of a synthetic braid besides you know, an actual flame that releases those um, toxins and those fumes because when you when you have the synthetic by itself inert it doesn't do anything not a bad thing but those fumes are what do you in and do um, affect your unborn child so uh, you know one of the ways that they can close off an end is to just use hot water or they can tie the ends of the extensions and you know all kinds of things use different materials there's blended materials uh, they can braid with thread and then maybe um, tie off an end uh, there's other things that they can do but they need to be aware that that's a very dangerous thing what are some yeah, one of the other things that a lot of people don't think about, and I've seen this throughout my entire career in many different fields, both male and female, but uh, hair salons and, and uh, cosmetology being one of them, is uh, the stuff that comes home with you, like yes. on your clothing, on yes. your shoes. I even suggest for some people that they just, if they have a lot of exposure to just change your clothes, or that's why the old smocks and people used to wear things, but they don't see it as much today. But really by taking those off, not tracking that into your home, doesn't get into your kitchen, doesn't get on your rug, doesn't hurt your pets and loved ones as much, those things can actually affect your home environment as Absolutely. well. Absolutely, they call it personal protective equipment in uh, some other industries but absolutely important. You can't just look cute and, um, you know, you can look cute in the coffin, but <laughs> who wants to do that? Um, yes, you have to protect your surroundings once you leave the salon. 
yes, take uh, showers. I'm not saying that this is, this is beyond hygiene. This is those those particles and those those chemicals that we can't see, but they're with us. Yeah, and, and so one of the things important. about showers is we suggest using glycerin soap for your washing rather than the, the creamier soaps. The reason is is because the glycerin will cut and clean off a lot more of the toxins that are either coming out of your body or on your body from the environment. What do you think about oils, different oils? Will they do the same as the glycerin? Uh, you know, oils have a, have a place here, but I, I don't know as much about that for actual cleaning purposes. Okay. They might have other effects, though, uh, to increase your immunity and uh, your, certainly your well-being in lots of different ways, yeah. Awesome. What is the, the clearest path, do you think, for someone who um, is starting to experience, actually, let's back up. What are some telltale signs that maybe you need to um, reevaluate what you're doing and how you're doing it? Well, um, one thing would be skin. Skin is your largest organ of your body, and you're going to see things happening to your skin because it is a filter, basically. It tries to keep things out, and it also, anything that's in tries to get out, uh, out through the skin. The other is the lymph, lymph system, and many people don't think about it. Uh, it is a like under skin waterway that we have throughout our body, and its job is to actually be the garbage and the cleaner in your body. That's what it does. And it doesn't have a pump like the heart or other things. It has only a uh, pump it has is motor pump. So is that the sweat gland? Uh, it, it's actually like your lymph nodes. When you get sick, sometimes you might feel, you know, getting you know tender uh -huh. here, tender here. These are signs also of toxicity, okay? So if you're getting sore here, sore in, under the arms or in the groin area, this is the major lymph nodes, but the lymph actually goes all over the body. And there are some very easy lymph massages that if I really would strongly suggest everybody do them, but. Uh, now, are those some of the things that you uh, demonstrate at your community yes. workshops? Yes, we okay. do. Yes. Can you describe one right now? Okay, you want a lymph massage? Yes. So, okay. Well, one of the things I like, it, believe it or not, we get kind of silly with some of these things. So uh, one of the things we do is just put our hands like this, and we put them right here where our arms meet. Can I do meet. this right yes? now? Yes, yeah, okay. that'd be great. And we just kind of do chicken dance a little bit. So it's towards the heart, and you are actually moving that lymph towards the heart area, okay? Ah. Yeah. And you can feel that, okay? So you're right that the sweat glands are there, too, because they are, they are part of getting that uh, toxins System. out of your body as well. But the rest of it goes to your heart and out through your urine. As a matter of fact, if you do lymph uh, work, you'll often find your urine getting kind of dark uh, when you're doing it. Because you're cleansing. Yes, yes. But there are many others that we sweep over the body very lightly. You can even go to a massage therapist that does this work as well. But there are many ways to do it for yourself. And I even suggest doing it in the shower when you're in the shower. Awesome. <laughs> um, I did attend one of your workshops. It's been quite a while, but um, what is the most common type of thing that you see in, in your workshops? Or I'm, I'm sure in your practice, everything is, you know, it's as individual as the individual. Oh, yes. But are there more common things that you're seeing, say, in these last few years? Yes, and I would say that I, I'm writing a book on this subject, so it's, and it really has to do with Do you have people. a title yet? Oh, well, no, not really. Okay. Not an only okay. working title, but okay. we have, it, it's about asymmetrical tonic neck reflex. And, and that is a very common uh, retained baby reflex that a lot of people have. And I think that it really fits because I knew somebody came to me who was actually a hairdresser. And I was working with her and she was having some, some different issues with her, her, uh, her health and she wanted to find out what, and we thought toxins, right? Well, she raised her arms up over her head, and I noticed immediately that one of her armpits was wet and the other one wasn't. It was like, stop. What now, was that? Yeah, well, I'll tell you. An ATNR, the asymmetrical tonic neck reflex, a lot of people have it contracting on one side. So this shoulder and hip are in contraction, and it actually stops the lymph and the sweat glands from actually from operating. Oh and so what happens is you get like a tilt in your head and so you're holding, so again, your neck, and if you're doing any work, you, you get the little tilt on the head or you're standing on one leg a lot. These things are all signs that that reflex might be, uh, might oh. be there, raw. And so you have an asymmetry in your body 
And so your weight, your knees, your hips, your arms, your neck, your back, and you can imagine if you're, you're a person who uh, works in this uh, field, you're going to need that. There's so much about ergonomics and that type of thing. Um, and they say it's as simple as sometimes, just standing and looking at yourself in the mirror. Yeah. And if you look at yourself and you just, there you, go. you know, you're lopsided, <laughs> um, you know, get some kind of, of con consultation or help. Don't well, just we necessarily do that. We run. We work a lot with asymmetrical tonic neck reflex. And even if it wasn't, stop, you didn't get it because of that. Some people get it because of accidents or other things. This asymmetry, you, you can actually go back and use developmental tools from your younger years to retrain that area, to release that tension and to allow your, uh, your, both your lymph and your muscles and your uh, connective tissue to work better. That is so awesome. There was one woman and, and um, the stats are one in five stylists will have some type of illness or ailment related to the profession. And that's, that's most unfortunate. Um, and I saw that with a salon suite that I was working in. There were probably eight, it was fairly new. There were about eight of us in the, that were renters out of the 24 spots that are available. And our massage therapist, she just looked so sturdy and she had been in the industry for many years, didn't have any issues that we knew about, but she, uh, and she looked, I mean, she just looked so strong. She looked like she could pick up a car and hit you with it, you know? Mm -hmm. And she had a stroke. Oh Maybe it had to do with, you know, the long-term things. We don't know. But in that same set of people, again, there's only like eight of us in there. There was another lady, also had been in the industry for many, many years, uh, went to the hospital with pneumonia. Now, pneumonia could be a very dangerous thing in and of itself. But anyway, short version, she passed away. So out of eight people, two of them had catastrophic things happen within a short amount of time. So it just let me know that my mission, which I've been talking about these same things for many, many years. As a matter of fact, I'm going to um, become a, a certified industrial hygienist, I believe. And um, first I'm finishing my behavioral science degree. But anyway. Uh, it, it let me know that there was something wrong and finding, you know, the path to, you know, how to correct some of these wrongs is, is where, um, why we're here today. What other things would you like to share with the, the group? We're going to talk a little bit later about tips and, and things that we can do to, to help. We're going to talk about trends and what things people maybe should rethink. Um, in participating, but in your experience, what is something that um, we should definitely make sure that we share with the well, service providers? Well, I would providers? say, uh, you know, really resilience in your system throughout your life is really important. And people think when they're young and they go into a field that that's how it's going to be their whole life. But as you probably know, and mo you know, anybody over 35 knows, you you get to it an age change. where things have to be rethought, and you have to start treating yourself better. Like you said, the sleep, the eating right, getting good exercise that's working your body in a proper way, uh, drinking lots of purified water, eating good food. You, you have to take that consideration if you want your body, brain system to work at maximum. And you don't have to wait till you're 35. No, you don't. No, you don't. You shouldn't. <laughs> but a lot of people think they can just keep on coasting. Uh, yeah, going through the way they have been, but you reach a point where really something might break if you don't consider it's like what a deck of cards or not a deck what do you call it the um the house of cards yes like a house of cards where you pull and you pull and this is a little depleted and this is a little off and but just that day get the right card and everything goes that's because stress itself is a neurotoxin Okay, mm -hmm. and yes, we, we need a little bit of stress to get us up and going and do it, but I call it a strama. It's stress trauma. <laughs> if you have too much stress for too long, your, your nervous system, your sympathetic nervous system gets into overdrive and then your adrenals are uh, misusing and if you have any neurotoxins, things aren't gonna go right. If your vagus nerve is not, which is your large cranial nerve, it keeps you calm. If that's not working right, and for lots of reasons it might not be, uh, that is 
really working against you to, to use your energy in an efficient uh, way that you can sustain over a long period of time. This is excellent, and we will continue our discussion with Carolyn Kraske and you, and we're gonna, uh, I, I collect information from a variety of sources, especially stylists, and ask them for tips, career tips, uh, you know, you know, just anything that will help their um, their path. And so we're going to look at some of the tips that they gave us, get your reactions, and uh, then make suggestions on, you know, what people should be doing so that we can, again, be more safe and have a total, um, total health experience, a positive health experience, even though we are kind of a fringe population. Well, so many in the field help others to relax, be happy, have good lives. I really want that for them as well. Awesome. Well, that's why we have you here. So thank you. And we will um, be back in just a moment. I work because this is what I've enjoyed doing all my life. For my little girl, I always loved messing with my sisters. Hey, they had beautiful hair. And I always enjoy doing this. Callie Terrell loves making women look and feel good. I feel good. Well, when I do it again, maybe pay more. <laughs> Mrs. Terrell now only works to keep busy and to satisfy a few longtime customers like her daughter, Inez. She's 99 years old and anxiously awaiting her 100th birthday in November. And if I give out my birthday to people, you have to pay for it. <laughs> November 26th. How old will you be? One zero zero. How about that? Her zeal for life is amazing, and so is her work ethic. WREG checked the state of Tennessee, and they first issued her license to operate on January 30th, 1945. She rents space in a salon now, but once had her own thriving business. She's outlived almost all of her customers. People my age that I used to buddy buddy with, I don't have a single one. I was in a bridge club. I'm the only one in the club that's living. Work is part of her secret to longevity. I'm not used to just being up in the house. See, I work so long. I've just been around people, so I enjoy being with people and doing something exciting. Most old people, they're so dry and droll. I can't deal with that. I got to live and I do the things that make me happy. Working brings her joy, but she plans to finally retire at the end of the year. But she says, don't expect to find her sitting around the house doing nothing. I just be waiting on somebody to call and say, how are you busy? And I said, no, well, they said, well, come on over here. We doing so-and-so. And I jump in the car and go, you want to do something. So there is hope in this field. You, you can have it all. As uh, the lady in Tennessee uh, had, you know, 99 years old, and she's still doing hair. So, you know, it, it can happen. Maybe they need to study us to see for those people, you know, what do they have going on that... They have studied quite a few different fields and I think it would be fascinating. We'd like to bottle whatever she had. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. And she's still driving. I don't know if you caught that from the clip, but she's still driving as well. Wow. So, um, so what I do is I collect information from a variety of sources and people and I ask for tips. And so I'm just throw out some of the tips that um, people have suggested for other people in, in the career or in the field who want to have some longevity. So one of the things was be confident in your skills. Important? Yes. Yes, I would say continue on developing them throughout your life. That's right. Mm -hmm. exactly. Never stop learning. That's right. Never stop learning. I like that. <laughs> um, it's okay to fire people. And I think what they meant with that is that um, sometimes you get clients who just don't match you. <laughs> and, That's true. And so um, their solution was to fire them. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think being happy and having a good attitude, you have to have people that, you know, if you have some client that's really making your life really, really hard, maybe it's 
a good idea to lower your stress yes. level. <laughs> yes. Stress causes hair loss too. Yes, it does. That's right. <laughs> um, so if it's gross or you don't know what it is, don't touch it. Is that overreacting? Well, depends. I mean, yeah. from my attitude, some people don't like to touch almost anything. We have people with tactile issues, but uh, as a whole, uh, you know, if you think it's a chemical or you think it's toxic, I would be cautious. Yeah. If it's something that you have to clean up, protect yourself. Yeah. Put your gloves on. Throw the materials away in a sealed container when you're done cleaning it up. That makes excellent sense. Um, ask more questions. Smart, smart yes. lady. Uh, or I don't know if that one was a guy or a lady, but it's, I, I think that's reasonable. Get vaccines. What would be the primary vaccine that you'd think that somebody should get in this industry? Well, you were talking about it before, it, yeah. you know, getting, uh, making sure that you have your tetanus and your uh, yes. hepatitis and the things that you might actually come in contact with uh, on, a, on a basis regularly with clients is a, probably a really good idea. <laughs> Maybe a flu shot. Mm, flu, flu shots, shots. yeah. Okay. Yep. Good ideas. Know what supplements really do for your body. Yes. Yeah, yes. there's a lot of antioxidants. I was going to talk about a few of those before, which, you know, even things like vitamin C and um, uh, uh, CoQ10 and uh, uh, alpha lymphatic acid, ALA. Uh, these are really good for uh, helping to clean out your cells and helping to clean out your body, as well as just taking care of things like B for energy and other things like that. I know that um, all supplements are not created equal, and so you do need to do your homework. Yes, you do. And uh, I know there are some that have counterindications, so if you're pregnant, you know, I, I think it's rosemary is one that you should not um, mm -hmm. use. But absolutely, um, do your homework. Uh, not everybody needs everything, and more of something isn't, nece isn't necessarily good. good. That can make you toxic. So you have to be aware. A funny little thing I ran across, um, Walnuts, just a handful of walnuts before bed. Um, they have something, it's not tryptophan that's like in turkey. There's something in it that makes you go to sleep. But then on the other end, a lot of oatmeal, which is a breakfast food, has walnuts. <laughs> so I'm like, somebody didn't do their homework. <laughs> Yeah, well, they both have protein, and almonds, too, have, uh, these are great snacks for people because they do have a lot of antioxidants, a lot of uh, minerals in them, and protein, which are, are, is a better snack than eating a lot of sugar if you can avoid it. Maybe, maybe not as good as five bags of chips. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, much better for you. Because, I mean, really, think about the salon. People um, eat on the fly. They have too much coffee and, you know, soda pop and that type of stuff everything if they if they aren't going out for food they're ordering in something you know fast food so yeah we have really bad diets and on top of everything else because we don't plan out our day because we want to you know get extra extra people in so yeah. and you don't eat when you should eat that's the other thing yeah you wait till the very very last moment before you're about to pass out on somebody that's and right. then you eat. Yeah, well, blood sugar levels really can be kept more steady with uh, better, better snacks and better foods that, you know, keep you less carbs and more protein. Most people know that, but it really is something that if they work on it, they'll notice a big difference. Awesome. Something else that I have found out, too, is um, essential oils. Uh, lavender can be very calming. Tea tree oil, and they're both antibacterial. The ones that you have to watch out for, if you are taking a bath and adding essential oils as peppermint, you don't want to put too much in there. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah, that can be well, good. it cools your body down too fast. Mm -hmm. So those things don't work so good sometimes. And those, the, the tea tree and the lavender are the only two that you can use without a carrier, which a carrier would be some type right. of oil. It's like an almond But they are very, something. yeah, almond oil or coconut oil or one of those. Excellent. I got the right people here today. Um, change careers if you need to. Mm. Yeah, because I think sometimes uh, people are more sensitive to some of these things than other people. And there are people who, uh, <clears throat> just a little bit of toxicity 
will just throw their whole body off. And I've seen That's people true. have to quit uh, cosmetology and other mm -hmm. fields just because of that. And it's sad, but some people should know. I mean, you're, you have a certain level. Your body's trying to tell you something if you're having real problems with it. How do you know when it's time to get out? If you know, if you're experiencing. Well, if you have, if you continue to have rashes on your skin right. all the time, that's one indication. Um, another one would be having problem with your hands. Um, joints. Joints, yes. mm -hmm. carpal tunnel. Breathing. Breathing. Uh, difference, eye uh, yep. irritation. Irritation. Even hearing and ear problems. Yeah. Or your nose running all the time. Right, allergies. Allergies. Yeah. Allergies. These are all, um, there are very few studies, but there's, you know, enough information out there, you are absolutely on point. There's not, when I say there's enough, it means that there's some, there needs to be more um, because they're not um, covering the, as many people as are experiencing these things, so. This. I also believe that um, having um, body massages yes. is probably better than taking all the medicine a doctor would have to give you. That and saunas too, because <coughs> saunas help you sweat and help you clean right. out your lymph system. And we were talking That's about true. it and, and drinking lots of water. These are yes. all ways to flush out a lot of things. And sometimes we just don't take the time. And it's important to remember that you gotta take care of yourself. <laughs> That's right. Some you of do. the services that we offer to our patrons, we should be <laughs> utilizing. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Um, um, one last one of these, and then we're going to talk about trends when we were talking about uh, the the water especially. So we'll get back to that. Last one, and this was this is mine. It's just kind of like a pet peeve. Um, read your product labels. We talked about that a little bit earlier, but can't emphasize it enough. Um, they do have symbols. If you don't want to read the little bitty print, they have symbols that mean something. <laughs> and it'll tell you what toxins or what hazards a product might have. Also, there's a cosmet or, um, cosmetic dictionary that will tell you a lot about what these chemicals are. You can look them up because it's like all these words on the bottom of a bottle, you might not know what they all mean. Yes, some of them you'll recognize, but not all of them. Yeah, that yeah. is excellent, <coughs> excellent advice. Um, when celebrities get involved, sometimes it can be good, so Jennifer Lopez had a nail infection and she was responsible for getting some laws changed in California, uh, especially related to nail techs and, and um, procedures. Sometimes it's bad. So one of the ones that's in the news right now is Kim Kardashian. She came up or she promoted uh, the, the term vampire facial and how cute is that? But basically, and there's another, there's a, there's a dermatology procedure that is, um, has more protocols in place to protect you. But what she was saying is you go to the salon, you get um, whole blood removed from a part of your body and then inject it into your face. And salons, because Kim is doing it, are offering this service. Oh my. <laughs> now they did already track two cases, and I'm sure there's more than that, but they tracked two cases of HIV uh, in Mexico. And I, I find it very difficult to believe that we don't also have it here because disease doesn't care, no. right? It doesn't no. care of your race, it doesn't, it doesn't care. No. Um, if, you, if you have the environment, it's going to be there. So. Um, so uh, there was one good celebrity example, one bad ex celebrity example. But there's a lot of trends out there that I'm not sure who should be responsible for. So, <laughs> so, so I'll just name some and then you tell me um, <clears throat> overall, you know, who is ultimately responsible for, you know, offering these services or performing these services or you know the risk involved with things and I'll just read a, a few of them if I can find them um, one of them oh um, snake massages there's fix a flat Botox so literally that that chemical that you use to fix tires they're using that instead of Botox um, flow beds those have just hit um, Minneapolis or Edina, somewhere in our in our vicinity. Um, there's a flesh-eating fish pedicure. They they have you know much cuter terms than this, but the ultimate 
thing that's happening are these little minnows are eating the flesh from your feet. Um, they outlawed that here several years ago. They don't do it in Minnesota. No, well, I think you should watch out for a lot of fads, period. Yes, fads, you know, period. almost fads in everything, you know, in diet and yep. in exercise and in these things. You know, you need to be thoughtful about, yeah, it sounds, oh, that sounds cool or whatever. You know, you really want to think about, you know, fads because they haven't been around very long. We don't have a lot of regulatory things around them. You're responsible for your own self and those around you, you know. So you should uh, probably uh, look carefully at what you're getting into and what it involves. And if it has to do with uh, tissues and blood and, you know, yeah. uh, le these things, you're going to want to be really thoughtful about it, I would say. I would say buyer beware. Yes, absolutely. Exactly. There's a term you mentioned, um, uh, uniform universal precautions mm -hmm. and so treat every everybody fluid basically as if it's contaminated you don't know yeah and so do you want to take that risk or do you you know not and so good advice excellent advice um, what do you think about private certification uh, we were talking about this the stresses in maintaining a license yeah. and I know it's not just the cosmetology field that it's is experiencing you know all these changes with licensure um, what do you think about private certification is it a good thing or is it too much of a, a risk for wild wild west behavior um, what is your terminology for private certification? private private certification basically and it's that's also <laughs> in question yeah. but generically it's an entity who would set a standard and um, be able to issue you a license. So for example, if you have expertise in XYZ, um, you could train people or you feel confident enough to pass on a certification versus going, you know, having someone go to school for 20, you know, I won't say 20 years, but um, 1,550 hours, we'll say cosmetology so that you could do some of the things that we do. Now there are some things when you're dealing with chemicals, I think that's very important. When you're dealing with um, a, you know, a variety of things that we deal with, but they're still not preparing us for protecting ourselves. Right. So, yeah. you know, I don't know. It seems to me that, you know, I wish the certifications matched up with actually what would be good for the different fields. Because my field in neurodevelopment is, is not licensed under the psychology area, really. And because it, it's not. And it's not under the It doesn't OT, fit the box, any right, boxes. It doesn't fit any of the boxes. And so because of that, you know, we try to get different kinds of certifications, some private, some public, that we can kind of cobble together into it. But I, I if some bureaucrat came in and said, well, you can't you know, touch a child or you can't, you know, it would be difficult to do the field when you're working with the body if you can't do that. So you have to have people who are knowledgeable about the field to be able to know what's important for safety for both the client and for the practitioner, in my eye. Because you want both to be safe and you want both to do well. And, um, you know, in my field, we just videotape you know, most things, and so it's a safety issue to make sure everybody feels safe, and we never do anything anybody wouldn't, you know, doesn't want or anything like that. So I know that there that you can put in your own safety things, but so I've seen both. I've seen a state cert certifications that haven't made anything safer, as a matter of fact, maybe less safe, and then you've got the other side where, well, yeah, you don't want the Wild West and people just doing anything they want in the world because people come up with some strange things. <laughs> Did I say flesh-eating fish? No, yes. okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, uh, I, I know that you don't have to have a license per se to have standards and high standards and be aware of your craft. And so, that you know, there's there's probably some massaging and some happy medium that we'll, we'll come up with. But right now, um, I think um, private certification generically is a good way to go because the licensure uh, of certain, certain fields has not met the, the standard and it's not protecting people and it's, and it's not helping people yeah. and it's expensive. Right. So the return on the investment, yeah, it's not always that great. Any weigh-ins for uh, private certification? 
Well, I hadn't really thought about that, so I don't know what I would add to it at this time. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's, it's a thought. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, we talked about the trends. Okay, chemical, oh, which is the most dangerous to the service provider, in your opinion? Chemical hazards, ergonomics, health risk, and uh, those analyses, or something else? Well, it seems like health risks are all those things <laughs> to yes. me because when you're not, uh, you know, the ergonomic issue is one of, of, of your body <laughs> and your joints and your muscles and your posture and uh, repetitive stresses, et cetera. And, and the toxicity is obviously going to be a part of that as well and other, other areas. So I, I think overall just caring for you, caring about yourself and uh, wanting the best for you and and tuning in, we call it in my work. You tune in, is this going well for my body? Because sometimes we just, oh, body, do whatever we want, you know, and uh, our mind tells our body to do these things and our body will obey until it can't anymore. Mm -hmm. And so it's our job to tune in and say, body, how you doing there? You know? What would be a tune-in exercise? Was, was it that simple? Just yeah. Ask. Yeah. Well, we have a lower brain that's doing things automatically for us all the time. And it's where our intuition comes from, really. And our upper brain is our cortex, and we think about things a lot. And we're, we're always, oh, our schedule and what we have to do and this and that and the other. That's the upper brain, the, the boss, right? But sometimes the, the, that upper brain's so busy, it's not listening. Like even like, oh, I'm going to faint. I don't have enough water. Boom. You know, uh, we need to we need to be breathing. We need to be uh, getting uh, what we need to keep our bodies healthy and our joints healthy and our bodies uh, working as well as possible for as long as possible. So tuning in is one of the first ways to at least know. People think they have to block everything in these days, you know, because no. I've just force my way through things. Well, you know, that's not really how our bodies have been made. Our bodies in, in ancient times were, were, we only used that kind of stress hormone when we were like being chased by a wild animal or something, you know, and, and we didn't use it all the time. But now we're like always being chased by a wild animal in our modern life, it seems like, you know, we're running from thing to thing to thing under this great deal of stress. So uh, that's why tuning in and, and listening and knowing when you need to rest, Knowing when you need to take care of yourself is important. Well, also scheduling. Don't schedule so close that you don't have time to say, use the restroom, take a break, have a drink of water, go outside and get some fresh air. Light. <laughs> right, get some light. I used to take and tell all my students, take the mirror and go outside if, and look at this hair color and see if it's the right color because it doesn't look the same inside as outside. That's for sure. For sure. So, I mean, those things, you do have to take care of yourself. Schedule yourself for a lunch break. Even if it's only 15 minutes, you need to do that. You just can't work from six o'clock in the morning till six o'clock at night and not take a break. You and that's what people do. You get more in do. a day, but you won't get more in a, in a life. No, you won't. So, I love that. Yeah. It's true. It's the Very same true. thing when you drive on a trip. I make my husband stop at night. I said, I can't sit here any longer. <laughs> we have to stop, we have to get some exercise, we have to rest. You, because you take and drive from here to Florida and you don't take a break and you don't stop and sleep. <laughs> what did you save? You get there and you're sleeping all day. You're sleeping, yeah. <laughs> trying so to So you up. didn't save anything. And your car might not even go with that. No. So we should take care of our bodies at least as well as we yeah. take care of our vehicles. Right. So, um, we mentioned several times that one in seven people have HIV and don't know it. The CDC says that you should get tested once a year. How, especially with our just getting started to take care of ourselves, how can we introduce that concept or ways that uh, we can connect with uh, stylists so they start doing those types of things? Any ideas? Well, because I work primarily in a school with students, I would go and ask them, have you oh, taken your lunch break yet? And if they said no, I said, I'll get somebody else to watch your client and you go take a break. Go eat something, get a drink of water, whatever. Do so you you're watching out for them. Oh, I am. Okay. Would you yes. think a school then, it, would that be a good place for them to understand HIV and be yes. able to know that those are something they really should be Yes, and we do of? stress that in school. We go over these things like, you know, standing and positioning and body um, plus 
eating and drinking nutritionally and getting a break, getting some fresh air. I mean, doing but these Carol things. But Carol is next level. Carol actually cares about her students. Yes, I do. <laughs> and, so, and, and, you know, it, it makes a difference. Uh, that's why they speak so positively of you. That's why you had so many successes. But not every school does that. And You're it's right, not part of the part of the industry. Um, well, so, so that would be a how great can we, How can we have more of you? <laughs> well, I don't know that. Mm -hmm. um, probably training instructors, which I've trained a lot of them, but that doesn't mean they go out and do what I do. What you train, yeah. You, what you train them to do. The same thing is like when you train them in school, do they go out and proceed to do those things that they should be doing in a salon? I don't know that because I'm not with them. Sure. True. And sometimes they'll say they'll come and ask, well, who would you go work for? Well, you know that person at a different level than what I know them. You're going to be an employee. I know the person on a professional level and I don't work for them. So it could be totally different what you're, you know, but you how you perceive them. that per, that person or that salon? It is. It's a. It's a. It's a tough thing. Act. Yeah, yeah, it's a it tough is. thing to do. But it must be done, or we're not going to um, do well. And we haven't been doing well. Or, you know, it's we we need to be studied. I'm not sure right. if we're doing well or not. Well, there might be True. places online too that I don't know where. The, uh, the uh, cosmetology world hangs out there, but you know there may be places that p can post information about HIV and other health-related things for them. That's what I do on my website. Um, it's um, 3H Wellness. I established this whole little entity just to focus on these things, and as people tell me what they're interested in, I just post stuff and try to make them aware. Sometimes I have surveys and that type of stuff. And what we're going to do with this in the end, I'm not fully sure, but just awareness, awareness, awareness. Some of the courses, maybe you'll teach some courses um, uh, to help people um, just know better, do better, be better. That's my tagline. And uh, that's, that's the mission. One more little thing um, in our tips. What are some potential partners, like you said, you know, you suggested schools. Um, what are some potential partners that you could think of that stylists should maybe tie into or, you know, have you seen any types of things? Boy. Hmm. Not yet. Maybe they could have uh, special sauna spa days for... Uh, for, for, for safety, yes, safety exactly. spa day. Yeah, and I they could know. go in and have fun and <clears throat> take care of themselves and do that. that. That might be really a good idea and you can talk shop and have a good time. That's excellent, True. excellent Good idea. idea. Excellent. Well, I just appreciate both of you for being here, Carolyn Kraske. Um, just, I'll say, stylist extraordinaire, <laughs> <laughs> caring advocate, and Janet oh. Oliver, <laughs> um, neural development specialist, That's neural funny. developmental specialist, That's correct? Right. That's correct, uh, good for new you. New PhD, <laughs> book on the way. And uh, this is very, very good. I just do what I do. Um, I, do I did run across a quote from John F. Kennedy, and it said, one person can make a difference and everyone should. So I thank you all for being here today and do what you can, start with yourself, and then we'll grow from there together. Thank <laughs> you.